The fear which many have about the future of the world's environment can be seen on the island of Spitsbergen, not far from the North Pole. Here, buried in the permafrost, is a massive seed bank containing backup copies of the world's major food crops. It serves as a reminder of how fragile our ecology is and how dependent we are on things which we take for granted. As humans, we were reminded of this again in Fukushima, Japan in 2011 when there was a serious nuclear accident, which itself brought up memories of the 1986 meltdown of Chernobyl in modern day Ukraine. These accidents, when they happen, do not affect only their immediate areas, or indeed even their regions, but can impact the entire world to a greater or lesser extent. This is also true for the ongoing ecological challenges which the whole world faces. Rising sea levels, increasing temperatures, desertification, land degradation, pollution, resource depletion and many others besides. As Richard Rogers succinctly puts it, the only way forward if we are going to improve the quality of the environment is to get everybody involved. Since so many of these problems do not have only one cause, but many interlinked causes, the only really viable solutions can come through multilateral means. In November and December 2015, attempts to do just this were made in Paris at the major climate change summit which was held there. In many ways this agreement was a litmus test for the way in which nation states are able, or not able, to work together effectively. It can be seen as a test of how people might be able to put aside different cultures and ideologies in order to secure an agreement for the future of the human race. At the time of speaking, early 2016, it is not known whether this agreement has been a success. If the agreement is to succeed, it will have to overcome a number of challenges, many of which can be seen to relate directly to some of the other aspects of globalisation discussed in earlier lessons. Here we'll look at two in particular. The conflict between developed and developing countries and different views about the environment arising from social and cultural differences. The two largest polluters in the world in terms of total carbon dioxide emissions are China and the USA. Between them they produce nearly half the world's total emissions, 16 million kilotons out of 35 million kilotons. Although it should be noted that the US per capita rate is more than double that of China. Any attempts to create meaningful, long-lasting changes <clears throat> must have the support of these two countries. However, from the perspective of China, as well as many other developing and transitional countries, any attempts to curb emissions at the same rate can be considered unfair, not only because China has a population around five times the size of the US, but because the US industrialised earlier and therefore had already done its polluting. The fact that China is doing so now, more than a century, rather than a century or more before, is not a reason why it should be unduly punished. Much of the data and analysis which exists only looks back to 1970 and ignores historical emissions, even though in the past countries did not have the benefit of modern, cleaner technologies, meaning that the pollution can be considered to be even worse. From an economic perspective, there is a further issue, that whilst it is those in richer, more developed countries who benefit from the damage to the environment, they are not the ones who suffer the most. The USA, for example, despite comprising only 6% of the world's population, consumes around a third of its natural resources, and, as we saw before, is one of the heaviest polluters. Moreover, the paradox of the situation is that developing countries are most at threat from climate change because they lack the capital, financial, human and social, to do much to solve the problem. Put simply, they are not really to blame for climate change, or at least they are much less responsible for it, and yet they are suffering the most for it. Indeed, the very existence of many societies and nation-states has come under threat because of climate change, 
a fulfilment of the point made by anthropologist Margaret Mead many years ago when she said that we won't have a society if we destroy the environment. For example, rising sea levels threaten to engulf the Maldives before the end of the century, thereby making it uninhabitable. And rising temperatures are leading to desertification and land degradation in West Africa. A further irony of this situation is now that many of these countries have, or are in the process of adopting neoliberalism. They are in a very real sense digging their own graves. The improved economic situation of millions of people around the world means that their demand for material goods also increases. And as technology improves, it becomes cheaper, though not necessarily more environmentally friendly, to produce goods. By 2020, it has been estimated that there will be more than 6 billion smartphones in circulation. This all puts further pressure on limited natural resources. The second point to note is that the environment is another area where different cultures have different opinions. For neoliberals, the environment is often seen as a resource to be exploited for economic benefit. This position can be described as anthropocentric, that is, considering human need first and foremost. It ties into the values of a consumerist culture, where the acquisition of material goods is sometimes considered to be the chief goal of life. For many others, however, the environment is something to be protected and nurtured. There are also very different perspectives about how these environmental problems can be solved. For some, there will always be a technological solution to these issues, and so we should continue to the, use the environment in whatever way we like. This might be in the form of renewable energy, for example, or new technologies, such as fracking. Others feel that there should be specific restrictions made, which states are legally bound by. Others yet propose economic mechanisms such as carbon credits, whereby countries which pollute less can benefit financially by trading their credits with countries who pollute more. There is thus a financial incentive to produce fewer greenhouse gases. In conclusion, as with international law, as we will see in the next lesson, getting any kind of agreement on matters of ecology is a real challenge because of the hugely variant positions that exist both amongst individuals and nation states and because of the close link between the environment and the economy. The recent agreement reached in Paris appears to bode well for positive future changes but until the agreement is ratified by the individual parliaments of the signatories the world will hold its breath. <laughs>